So based on the previous feedback of my original flamethrower tutorial, I thought I'll do a longer version because lots of people complained that it was too short, too fast and was hard to follow. In today's video, I'll be showcasing you guys how to create a flamethrower using Houdini 18.5 and its new nodes. We'll be also using KineFX to get the animated rig inside and we'll be using the pyro tools to get some nice, exciting looking flame. After that, we will be doing some shading in Arnold, making sure the flame looks nice and juicy and then we go into Nuke to composite it all together to get a final good looking flamethrower for you guys. A few months ago, I have started a Discord community to share and help others in the industry. It has been growing to two and a half plus members already. So I would highly appreciate it if you would like to check out the Discord channel. It's about VFX, about lighting, shading, rendering effects, all that fancy stuff. Also, if you like what I do and you want to support me more than just liking the video, you can head over to my Patreon account and check the pledges I offer. There's also a quite interesting uh, tier about mentoring. So be sure to check out my Patreon. The link is in the description below. So now let's get cracking, dive into Houdini and get that flame going. See you inside. All right, so let's do it. You can see my scene is already prepared. I have an asset in this scene. I will be showing you quickly how I set it up. I used the um, Mixamo assets from um, Adobe. I have a few FBX animations already. You can see I'm, I'm clipping them together using motion clip sequence to bring them all into one kind of long motion clip. And then the final, the important thing is to evaluate it. So now you have this actually the skeleton moving. Um, I applied a rig pose to adjust the hand movement, which is now sticking, which is great. And then I use the FBX character import to get our mesh in and then using the bone deform at the bottom to bring it all together. Right now you can see he's actually holding the weapon. And with the help of the CG wiki and their Discord channel, um, someone on the channel helped me out with this constraining issue. So obviously I did um, create the little geometry first. It's quite straightforward, just beveling and edge loops. Um, nothing too crazy on the front here. And then all I had to do was um, create this capture capture pack geo. And what it does, it actually um, brings it all together. So it actually locks it to the um, joint of the skeleton. You need to specify the geometry and you need to specify a joint. I want to lock it to the hand wrist, which I did. And then you just confirm that and then it jumps to that position. You need, might need to use a transform to actually move it, but then it's locked to that position. After that, the bone deform, which brings it all together and everything is working as expected. I'm just splitting out the weapon and the body so I can prepare the particle source for the pyro sim. And then I have the ground plane, which is just a bend modify on a grid. And I have a camera and an environment light and a key light. And this all comes down together into the camera view and he's just walking backwards. For the pyro to work, we need to have a good source. And the source would be some kind of fluid which is emitted from the flamethrower. Right now, the flamethrower is just um, the geometry and there you don't see any particles coming out of it. So I'm just creating new context here, which is a, um, we just do this, maybe prep the source of our sim. And I'll just diving in here and I'm bringing the gun in here using the object merge and I'll just uh, find our out weapon and we have this guy in here. Right now it's a packed geo, which means we just have a single point for it. We want to unpack it like that. And now we have the geo in here. So what I want to create is I want to create two points which um, calculate the normal direction so our particle emission is working properly. I'm using that with a blast and I'll be just picking the points in the front here which I'm blasting off and then I'll do the same for the points in the back of this guy. Um, and then what I need to do, I need to create a pack geo again. So we get, um, create a point in the center of this little geo here. And I want to do the same on the other one. So now we have two points. You can see there's the point in the middle and this one has the other point right there. And that's quite good because now I can actually calculate the normal direction between those two points. What I want to do is just create an add here so we don't have any geo to work with. So but this essentially just removes the geo footprint and just um, leaves the point. You can see the point is a leftover, so that's quite good. And now what we want to do, we want to use a point wrangle to uh, do some point operations and to calculate our normal direction. So I'm just hooking up both points into the point wrangle. And all I need to do now is create a new attribute called normal and I want to calculate the point of our first 
particle and I want to extract the P position of the first point, right? And I want to subtract the other point from that. So essentially it's the same. I just want to target the input number one, get the P of the first particle, and then we should have our normals in place. Um, and you can see they are pointing in a direction, which is correct. So you can see normals are calculated and it, they always follow our weapon, which is amazing. This is what I wanted. And so what we want to do now is we want to create our particle emitter. So I'm creating a little sphere. And I want to move that to the point. So I do a copy to points like that. And now we do have a big sphere following that little point. Let's obviously scale it down maybe to 0 0.015, disable normals, and we have our sphere in place. What we want to do now, we want to emit particles from this. And for that to work, I need to generate points on it. You can use scatter, but scatter is only on the surface. So I want to use points from volume. And this automatically creates me a little point cloud of points inside if your point separation is small enough. So I'm trying 0.015, maybe 0.005, and we get some points in the center of the sphere. Maybe go even lower, 0.25. Now you can see we have a grid of points. I want to jitter them, so I'm just increasing the scale so we have a random point sort in here. I don't want to jitter this every frame, so every frame is a bit different. So I'm just putting in the dot frame variable, so everything is now nice and unique per frame. Um, so this now follows our object. We do have 800 points on the sphere. And now all we got to do is create a um, pop net in the hopes that everything will be working. Um, we want to jump in here and delete our merge and target um, all points of the first context. And right now you can see um, not, they are just essentially moving with the grid because we don't have any gravity. So let's give that some force. Now everything should be falling down, but we don't have any direction, right? So what we want to do is create some velocity based, based on our initial normals, right? So right now we don't have even normals on our jittered points here. So what I want to do here is create an attribute, um, attribute transfer. And I want to transfer the normals from our initially created point from the point wrangle. So let's just see what this looks. So now just by doing the attribute transfer, we get the normals on our points, which is great. Let's just rename this to generate um, n. And now we have normals, right? What we want to do though, we want to create velocity. So to do that, I'm just using a new node called ad attribute adjust vector, which I just pop in here. And what I want to do, I want to make sure that our pre-process is um, overriding by a um, normal attribute and now we should have our velocities being applied to our points. Important though we want to adjust the length only and now we can essentially have a multiply of how strong the velocity is. And now if you go into the pop net you can now see if I view from my camera and hit play you can see now the points are being emitted and we get this nice trail of points. Right now it's a bit messed up because um, we need to do some kind of cleanup work within our pop net. So because of the steppiness, what I'll always do, I go to birth and I jitter the birth time to negative and have interpolation to backwards. This already cleans it up quite a lot. You can see now it's nice and smooth already. I want to adjust the life expectancy maybe to 0.2 of a, of a second, and I want to vary it maybe by 0.25. This way we do have a fade and the particles die off after some time. Um, it's, my, it's maybe a bit too long still, so let's just reduce this a bit more and maybe adjust the variance as well. So it's a sharper fade off like this is working quite well. And I think our gravity is a bit strong. So I'm just reducing um, or reducing the effect of gravity to 0.3. So we have more like a straight line. And this is already working um, better. What I want to do though, I want to adjust our um, uniform um, feel of the source, right? The stream is quite straight. I want to apply some kind of force to it by creating a pop force, which allows me to add some turbulence to everything. So if I just increase the amplitude to 10 maybe, let's just have a look what that does. You get this jittering. I want to increase the swirl size so we get larger patterns. And I want to um, reduce the pulse length so the effect is um, faster. Let's just see how this looks. Let's check real time. Let's make sure real time is on. 
So this is now the speed of this. I think the amplitude is a bit much, that's for sure. Um, but we do get the desired effect, I believe. So let's reduce the amplitude maybe to three and check it out again. I think now it's nicely broken up. Let's play this back again. You can see there's definitely some motion. Um, it's, it's, not, it's definitely more random, which is good. It's not like a uniform straight line. And I think this, is, this will work in our favor. What I still want to do, I want to um, have the stream to expand a little. And what I can do in the attributes, I can add to my in er inherited velocity and add a variance. On default, this is spreading out too fast now. So I want to reduce the variance maybe to 0 0.1. Um, let's see how that looks. Let's just spread it out a bit more, maybe 0.2. All right, I think that works quite well. So what I want to do next, um, I want to add some kind of noise pattern to the stream. I want to have some kind of temperature and burn attributes, which are needed for the pyro simulation. So I like to use the adjust vector for this, uh, sorry, the adjust float for this, and pipe it in before the pop net. So, and I want to change the P scale to burn, and I want to visualize that. Also, what you can do, you can change the type to black body if that's um, a bit easier to see. So whatever is white will be hot, essentially. So right now we have a constant value of zero, so nothing is happening. What I want to do, I want to apply a noise to it. And I want to make sure that the noise is animated over a period of time. And we want to pull duration to be maybe point a quarter of a second as well. And because our initial sphere is super small, I want the element size also to be very small as well. So I'm trying maybe 0.015, and now let's see what this looks like. And see now we do have lots of random values, and it's, um, it's just very random noisy everywhere. So maybe increase the element size to 0.1, and now we get these bigger chunks. So we have white, black, and it's actually now nice and random. So what I want to do, though, is I think it's a bit too aggressive. So we don't want the burn to be zero. So I'm changing my minimum value maybe to 0.8. So we do have some kind of um, um, range between 0.8 and 1, which is a good breakup. And it's just not as aggressive. Also, in the pop net, I want to go um, to the dop net and just increase our sub steps to two. So we have a bit more sub steps, which makes the simulation a bit cleaner. And we don't have this large steppiness anymore. Also, I want to do a quite similar thing to temperature to break up that as well. I just want to change the attribute name to temperature. Temperature. Um, that way we also have a varying temperature as well. Maybe offset it so it's not the same, um, exactly the same um, noise pattern, maybe 3.5. And now we do have already two different attributes on our particles, which is great. All right, next up is we want to prepare this for our pyrosim. So we need to rasterize those attributes so we get actually a volume for the pyro to work with. So what we want to do, we want to um, use temperature, velocity, and burn. And we also want to um, use density, which we don't have yet. Um, it's quite easy to do. We just create it. And I think actually by default, um, it does create it. But let's just use a, pop, a point wrangle just to create um, density on everything, right? So I'm just using F at density is equals to one, quite easy, nothing fancy here. Set density, and now we have that. I wanna make sure that I normalize by clamped average, which gives us a normalized result. And also I want to reduce my um, particle scale maybe to 0.01. So we have um, smaller particles and I want to reduce my voxel size as well to get more detail into our source. So let's reduce the voxel size even more and increase our particle size. And I think this works quite well. We just want to make sure it's roughly the same size as our initial um, particle stream. So the, this works already better. Make sure you enable velocity blur to get this nice streaking effect. And this seems to work already quite nice. What I want to do, though, I want to make sure that we stop emitting those particles at some point. So um, before we do all these calculations, what I want to do is create a switch node um, right in here. And I want to switch it to a null, which is essentially just saying, OK, there's no geo to work with. I want to turn off the particles. 
So the switch is essentially just switching over from the current frame once it's bigger than, let's say, 90 as our um, frame range. And then it's, it's on and on up until frame 90, and then it's disabling it. It's quite easy, nothing fancy going on. And so let's do a file cache to write this actually down to disk. And let's just call this one pyro source. So let's just create a null here to have our out like so. And now let's just um, do a save to disk here. All right, so let's load it from disk. And now we see that our particles are dying off at a certain time and everything is working as I expected to. So this is a good um, time to create a new geo context for our simulation. So let's just um, color this actually to be yellow and the prep will be purple as well. And this will be pyro sim for our simulation. So let's jump in here and uh, create an object merge to bring in our volume, which we just created like that. And we can also um, then pipe this into our pyro solver, which is the sparse solver. And this already should give us something. We can see now we do get some kind of emission going on. It's not the best looking yet, um, but it is working already. So what I want to do here, I just want to reduce the voxel size maybe to 0.05. So we get a bit more data to work with. And I want to create this pyro bake, which is a new node, which is also essentially a, a shader directly in the viewport. And I want to make sure I enable fire, which is giving me this result. For the smoke, I always like to have a higher density, maybe 40, and I change the color maybe to 0 0.05 to get a nice dark smoke. Right now, you can see there is not much smoke going on. This is because the default um, solver has a high dissipation value, which I like to reduce to maybe 0 0.05. And if I hit um, simulate now, you can see now we are emitting a lot more smoke. For pyro, it's quite important to always, uh, or it's not important, but it's better to work with a dark environment which I do, and then also make sure that you enable um, lighting to get this nice shaded of the lights. And I, it's working because I have lights in my scene, which is the environment and key light. And this already now looks quite nice with everything enabled. So a few things I noticed already, I, I feel that we don't get the, the strong velocity, which I wanted, like I want to have this directional force. So in the sourcing of our um, pyro, I want to increase the velocity by two. So this is now multiplying the initial velocity. And you can see now everything is pushed towards uh, the, the direction of travel, essentially. What I also want to do, I, I want to adjust the buoyancy. I find that it's going up too fast. So in a simulation, you have this buoyancy scale, which I just reduced maybe to 0.65. And uh, let's see how that looks. You can see everything is now going uh, more straight. It's not as directional upwards. I think this works a bit better. We still get a strong effect of the pluming here, of the smoke, which is good. Um, so I just want to maybe adjust the flame length. Right now it's on two, so maybe go 1.5. So the flames are not going or living as long as they are right now. And also what is important is to add some kind of um, breakup into your simulation. So within um, the shaping, I want to introduce tubulins. I, I will exaggerate this now maybe to five, so just that you can see what's going on. Um, you can already see these twirls of um, smoke going all over the place. And this is what tubulins is doing. It's only affecting the smoke right now. But I want to reduce this maybe to point, um, maybe just to down to one and let's see how that works. What is important because we increase our velocity, um, we need to adjust our sub-stepping just because it's moving so fast. So within the simulation under advanced, you can increase your maximum sub-steps. I will go up to three for this um, flamethrower just because we have very fast moving objects and this will alter the shape of the simulation a lot. Also, I think we need to adjust the shader. I think the density might be a bit too much. So I'm just reducing this so we get a bit more um, smoke coming through and light coming through the smoke, which already looks a bit better now. And what I want to do then is you can see we have these uniform big plumes of smoke, which are quite boring and not really that realistic. And the way to do that is to actually apply some disturbance to our velocity fields. You can enable them within here, but I like to do it within the Pyrosova because I will be doing a bit more than just one gas disturb. And disturbance is essentially disturbing the velocity field based on one of those grids. 
And right now the binding is density. It's density is essentially driving the velocity. Um, right now, this is on continuous mode. I want to change this to block based, which means we have we are starting off with a block size of three, and then we are for, per sub steps we are reducing the size, so we get large scale, and then it's smaller and smaller and smaller. So let's just see how that looks. Let's me just store this or pin this view. Go back inside and see how this feels now. You can already see that these plumes are already breaking up quite nicely. We don't get this <laughs> um, uniform plume. Obviously, it's way too strong, but you, you get the idea. So let's just reduce the effect maybe to, to seven or, or five, maybe. Let's see how that works. Um, we get a little bit of the pluming, but then the smoke is nicely broken up and everything is already feeling more organic and for my taste. Um, I think it's maybe a bit too strong, so maybe leave it at, at five, which is good. And also what I like to add is wind. And wind is always available. Like in nature, you always have some kind of wind or turbulence going on. What I like to do, I want to increase my direction in Y. So I'm increasing the wind direction to two and also in X, maybe to two. So we have like a diagonal wind. Maybe we want to push it up a bit further. Um, I want to merge those two together. And let's see now how that looks. So yeah, you can see now that everything is pushed upwards again. It's similar to buoyancy, but now this is more directional based. I think it's a bit strong. So maybe go to one and two. So we don't have um, this strong wind direction. Also now, because of the wind, our um, disturbance is a bit broken up, I think. Uh, let's. So what we can do is reduce the block size maybe and increase the strength to th six. Also, the turbulence, I believe, is a bit strong. So this is now where pyro is a bit tricky. You need to adjust so many values to get a good looking result. And it might always be a bit tricky. But now this already works um, quite well for my taste. What I still want to see is like these micro break breakups on these smoke plumes. Right now, it's still a smooth surface, which is broken up, but I'm missing these really fine ones. So I'm creating another gas to stir here. But this time I'm binding it to temperature instead. Temperature like that. And I want to make sure that we are using continuous mode. So what this is doing now, if I bring these two together like that, we should see a high frequency noise on our smoke. And you can see already that it's now bro broken up quite nicely. We get these really fine details everywhere. I think that works already quite nice. We can adjust the strengths. Maybe it's a bit too high. Maybe go down to four. And we can adjust um, the threshold range. So um, everything from a temperature of 0.2 to zero will be affected now by this um, um, field. So we get a bit more effect on the flames, which you can see in these areas here quite well. Um, also make sure that you enable OpenCL so you have the advantage of your GPU. So I'm thinking, um, let's create a, a flipbook and see how our result looks like. So what I want to do, I want to reduce our um, our voxel size to maybe 0.03. And also for the play blast, I want to increase our sub-stepping maybe to 4. And now let's see how that looks like once we are back. All right, so this is now our current simulation. We can see that we have a bit of a strong disturbance on the volume, so I need to adjust that a little bit. But I think overall, this already works quite well. Um, and I think we need to add some kind of rotational force. Right now, it's still um, just, I don't see these nice movements going on. So what I want to change is two things. I want to update the disturbance so it's not as aggressive. And I do want to adjust um, maybe the dissipation. It's maybe dissipating not fast enough. And then I want to add rotational force to our um, simulation itself. So in the pyro solver, within the gas disturb, there is this add rotational force, which I just want to enable. And that's essentially it. Um, and then for the next thing, I want to reduce the overall disturbance by a little bit. So maybe going down to 2.5. And for the last step, the dissipation, which I want to change here to maybe 0.04, uh, sorry, to point, um, I want to increase dissipation, so maybe go to point 2.06. 
And then let's do another simulation and see um, how the changes look. All right, so this looks a lot better in my opinion. We have this nice rolling effect here. You can see it especially in this plume right there where the smoke is actually rolling um, underneath each other. It gives a really nice effect to everything. And I think the dissipation is just great. It's fading off very slowly and I think this works really well. Um, so what I'm thinking now is I will just do the simulation and do a file cache to disk so we can actually get into rendering. So I'm just creating a file cache here and I'll see you once that is done. Right, so now everything is cached to disk and now we can actually apply this to our render engine. So I'm using Arnold. So for that to work directly without caching out VDBs, we need to do a few things still. So um, let's just create a new group here, call it RNDR Pyro, something like that. Just that we have our um, fire nice and clean. So I'll create a green group here. And then let's jump in here, use an object merge to bring in our um, volume caches here. So as I said, we need VDB. So right now we do have a volume only. So what I need to do here is create a convert VDB, which will convert the volume to a VDB grid. So you can see now this is converted. I just, I do want to clean it up a little. So I'm using an attribute delete. It's always good to clean up your, uh, your sources. So I don't want to have any attributes. I just want to retain the name. So I'm deleting non-selected. So everything else will get culled, which is great. And now we do have a clean pyro um, sim here as a VDB. What I want to do though, you can see velocity is split in X, Y, and Z. And also make sure to convert it actually to a VDB. That way now everything is converted properly and the vector merge will work as well. So now we do have velocity, temperature, flame, and density. For Arnold to render properly, we only use need to use density and temperature. So I'm using a blast to actually disable or delete um, everything we don't need. So I want just density and temperature for now. I even don't care about um, velocity because I won't be rendering that just yet. So let's create an output null here, set it to out, and then this will be ready for rendering. All we need to do now is create a shader. So let's head over to material context, um, delete this maybe and create a new Arnold um, material builder, which we will calling pyro. And in here, I'm just creating a simple volume shader, um, standard volume and hooking that up to the volume slot like that. And then back to our object context, the RNDR needs to get the material assigned. So I'm just picking that in our material under pyro. So now everything should be good to go. Maybe um, we visualize the pyro sim. That way we have a nice representation in the viewport and we can pick a nice, um, frame here. Maybe let's work with this one and then hit save. Make sure you have auto save on and then just hit render and see what we're getting. So this is the default shader and it does not really look that well and it does not actually look close to our um, our viewport render, right? So we need to make sure that we get some kind of nice view to this. So um, the trick is obviously is similar we did on the viewport shader is to increase the density. So let's just um, jump into the standard volume and increase the density maybe to 25. Already now you can see we get this nice detail everywhere and this is already working quite well. Um, we don't have fire yet. So what we need to do is essentially just push our temperature. So we can increase the emission maybe to 20 you can see, start seeing we get some kind of um, fire look in here. And what I like to do though is I, right now it's using the black body, which is good, which is based on temperature, but I like to use the ramp, which is based on temperature. So what I need to do is create a volume sample and make sure we sample a float grid and we set the channel to temperature. Um, I always <laughs> have spelling, so that's why I pronounce it that weird. And this will actually drive a ramp and the ramp will need an input, which is our temperature grid. And then based off the ramp, we are driving emission color. Um, this way we have a nice representation of what we are actually dealing with. So what I wanna do with the ramp, I wanna pick um, the same shader we had in the viewport. So I'm heading back to OBJ and going to the pyro and in the pyro bag volume, I'm just copying the fire ramp here. Copy parameter, go back, alt left um, arrow, and we are back in our simulate in our material context. And I just want to paste that in here. And that way we get the same kind of um, ramp in our fire as well. 
You can see now it's getting a lot closer. What I want to do though, I think we still need to increase our emission, maybe go to 150. So now you get, you see it's getting hotter and hotter. And I think in the viewport shader, we added at 250. So this is already getting very close to our um, viewport here. Um, I think the density is maybe a bit much. And um, so let's reduce that maybe to 15. And see now we get more fire creeping in. Also, what I like to change is maybe the color um, of the volume it's of the density itself. Maybe go down to 0.1 or something in that range, just that we see some kind of shaping on the volume on the smoke here. And then in the volume sample, you can play around. You can remap the temperature grid a little bit. So I want to increase the bias, which means we get more fire tra uh, traveling over into the, um, the smoke areas. And I think this is already quite interesting. We get these nice darker areas and it's an overall nice effect. So um, what I want to do now is I want to change, skip to a different frame. So maybe try something like um, frame 55 here. So at some point um, we are hitting our limitations of what we can do within the shader and we need to play around with render settings a little. So right now we do not have any secondary lighting from the fire. So what you need to do is go to your render settings and within ray depth, you have this volume um, option here. So le let's try increasing this to three, which should allow us allow more light into the volume. It de is definitely a lot slower, but you can see now we get more lighting within um, the volume itself, which is quite cool. And then again, you can adjust the volume indirect samples, which will clean it up a lot more. This is now our result of the current shader. So what I want to do now is I want to add some kind of um, surface displacement. And it's a cool trick which you can do in Arnold. You can create a noise and make sure it's going from um, minus one to one in terms of the value. And then also uh, make sure you are creating vectors. And then you can create a vector map on top of that which enables you to create some vector noise on our displacement. So make sure the vector out goes to the displacement sampling. And then you should be able to see um, already something is displacing. Make sure that you enable color to sign, which is normalizing those values. Now you can see that the displacement is being warped, which is great. We just need to adjust our scale, maybe go um, up to eight. That way we get this nice um, breakup. And obviously we want, uh, want it not as strong. So in the vector map itself, you can dial down the intensity, maybe go 0.05. And you can now see that we do have some kind of distortion going on. Obviously this is still way too strong. So um, a few things, I want to increase the octaves maybe to four and maybe add a little bit of distortion. And what I also want to do is make sure that every frame has a different noise pattern. So I want to um, create a dollar $f variable within the time here, which means every frame, it's a different kind of noise pattern. Um, I still think the intensity is too strong, so maybe go to 0 .001. Uh, 01. That way we get a little bit of this effect. It's not too intense, but we still get an overall breakup. Let's try uh, 1.5. And let's render this here. So you can see now that the base of the flame has this little bit of a warping, which is if effectively adding a bit more detail to the simulation. It's a quite effect, a quite cool effect, which you should just use quite subtly, but I think it, it's working quite well. So uh, what I want to do next up is make sure that we are actually enabling our denoising so we can actually um, have a cleaner render. So it's important that you enable the output variance AUV and have half precision on and then obviously have a nice file path. And then just um, render this to disk and then I will see you in compositing. So once we are in Nuke, what I want to do, I want to do a little bit of color grading. First of all, I want to create a great node to just add a bit more contrast into our smoke and fire. So I'm just increasing the black point slightly to get a bit more black areas and I'm also uh, reducing the white point to essentially get more whiteness into this. So we already see a nice difference from before and after. Um, the next thing what I want to do is maybe try to get more detail within the flame. So I'm using the exposure node uh, to reduce the oval exposure uh, until I see a, a cool result in the flame itself. And I think something like this will bring us nice detail. But what I want to do now is I want to mask our um, effect here. So I'm creating a Kia, which is a luminance based key. And if I look at the alpha channel, you can see only the fire is essentially being selected. You can adjust this a bit more freely if you need to. Um, to have a bit more control over everything. 
something like that. So you just want to really isolate the flame. You don't want to get as much as I'm getting right now, but I think this should work quite well. And then if I hook it up to the alpha slot, you can see now that we are affecting um, the flame on the inside. I also want to blur this map because it's a bit too sharp. Using a blur node, um, it will blur the alpha a, a little bit. And we just want it subtle, so we create a nice little um, softer edge here. Don't make it too strong because you will get black areas. But I think this works quite well. And then we can adjust the exposure. We just want to reduce it a tiny bit to get a bit more detail within the flame itself. And I think I'm quite happy with this. So another cool thing, um, what I always like to do is adding a kind of lift because I think the blacks are now a bit too much. So I'm using the toe operation, um, which is essentially lifting the blacks. Obviously, just do it very gentle. You don't want it to be super um, strong like this. It's just a minuscule amount to get a little bit more fill into those dark areas. On top of that, what I always do is adding glow. And I'm using um, a plugin or a free plugin from Nukepedia, which is called Expo Glow. And I just uh, create that, which allows me to generate an exponential glow on top of everything. I want to make sure I'm adjusting it before I'm applying it so I can go into the pre-grade section and I only want to affect the hot area. So I, quite similar to our exposure mask, we're just isolating these very hot areas with the black point and even lift the white points a little bit. Um, then we can go back to our um, original result, which looks like this now. And then all we got to do is adjust our post-grade intensity. And by adjusting this, you can see that we're just applying the glow very gentle to the bottom part here. I want to increase the exponent so I have a, a larger radius of the, of the glow. You can see now it's going over a lot more, which is already looking quite nice. Obviously, you, you want to play it very, very gentle. You don't want to go overboard with this. And you can also desaturate the glow a little if it's too orange looking. But I think this works quite well. And see now it adds some quite nice fire effect to this. What I always do as well is using chromatic aberration. This is obviously up to you if you want to do it. I like to use it quite gentle as well. It's just helping a bit to get this realism back in shape here. And then the final thing I always do is adding grain on top of everything because the CG stuff is just super clean. I'm using the regrain from Furnace Core, just plugging that in, picking a preset and adjusting the size. Um, so we are on Fuji 250 under 2K, and I just want to adjust the grain amount uh, and the grain size. We just want it to be very gentle, nothing too obvious. It's not too obvious, so I'm just reducing this to be just almost not no noticeable. And this is essentially what I am doing here. So this is um, before and this is after. Before and after. So it just adds a little bit more detail and contrast to everything. And I think this is always a good idea to do that for your compositing as well. So now let's have a look at the final render and you be the judge of the quality of this. I hope you guys enjoyed the in-depth tutorial about the flamethrower and I hope all the questions which you had are being answered in this video. Please let me know if you liked the video by leaving a thumbs up and also if you haven't done so I would highly appreciate if you would subscribe to my channel. So thank you again for watching my videos and I will see you in the next tutorial.